Hello, good evening, semester, and everyone. Um, my name is Louise. I work as a colleague to, or I am a colleague to Frederick, working at Albayeco as a science communicator. And my role today is to moderate some of the science discussions. First, I will have an, an announcement to make, and there's a change in the program. Unfortunately, uh, Patrick Dombrowski, who would be uh, in the second act, is not coming tonight. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Johan Rockström. Johan is a professor of natural resource management and is also the executive director of Stockholm Environment Institute and Stockholm Resilience at the Stockholm University. And Johan will place the coral reefs in the global context of the global challenges we face today. Please, Johan. Thanks a lot. And um, good evening, all friends of coral reefs in the world. Hardenada, Anders. Uh, wonderful to be here. What beautiful music and what a beautiful planet. The planet that hosts all the biomes that form the basis for our human well-being, which we tend to forget. The planet that hosts our polar regions, our wetlands, our grasslands, our rainforests, our temperate forests, our oceans, but also our coral reefs. And the interesting thing is that when you go up in the high politics of the big priority issues for human development right now, very few people talk about coral reefs. That's surprising because coral reefs is in no doubt the most important red flag for humanity at this point. It's the very harbinger of the early warning that humanity may be pushing ourselves beyond safe boundaries for our own development. And it's therefore highly surprising that what you see normally in the kind of broad agenda of communication is, is this front page of The Economist. When we had a financial crisis in 2008, the big issue was the vortex of our communication-based societies going right down the drain. But something happened in May this year when suddenly The Economist came out, a journal that I respect highly, but one should remember that just five, six years ago was still a journal that was questioning whether humans were really causing global warming. But it came out in May with this front page, welcoming humanity to the Anthropocene. I would argue, and many colleagues, scientists around the world would argue, that this is perhaps the most significant achievement of global change research over the past 30 years. The insight now becoming more and more understood in the broader area of business, of policy, of development, that humanity has become a geological force. We may be pushing ourselves out of the geological era, the one that we all learned in school, that we are since the last glaciation in the warm period called the Holocene, but that we in fact may now, humanity, seven billion people multiplied by our industrial metabolism, have become a geological force at the planetary scale, the Anthropocene. And the evidence for this is coming out of science over a long, long period of time, and I'll show you the summary of the evidence here, but look at this interesting citation that comes from The Economist, that it concludes in its very pertinent, conservative way, that when reality is changing faster than theory suggests it should, a certain amount of nervousness is a reasonable response. I mean, that's an understatement, to say the least. But it's interesting, and as a summary, is that science is so far to be criticized because it's underestimating the pace of change in the real world. We are, in fact, seeing a turbulence where the biomes of the world, where the coral reefs are the most threatened, are interacting with our economies in real time, giving feedbacks that could undermine our own development. Now, the more scientific evidence has also had impact on influential people like Ban Ki-moon, who pointed out before the climate negotiations that we are, in fact, based on the IPCC research, on our way beyond two degrees warming on the planet, and I'll come back to the impact on coral, where he states that we have our foot on the accelerator driving towards the abyss. One purpose of raising the importance of coral reefs is, of course, to say, well, he may be right, but we need also to turn on the light so we can see where we're driving and to understand that we may be running into potholes along the way and therefore find solutions, moving from the current predominant perception, as Pat pointed out, to looking at things from a new perspective. Interestingly, based on the research that we've been 
leading over the past 10 years or so. Ban Ki-moon also stated in the General Assembly just two weeks back that we are now also threatening planetary boundaries and we need to find ways of a global transition towards a more safe future. And the importance is that all of these boundaries are now infecting, affecting coral reefs, which I'll be showing. Okay, so it all comes from this insight. You don't see what is on the graph here, but you see the pattern. These are a multitude of scientific graphs showing empirical observations of how our home is feeling right now, which is from carbon dioxide to eutrophication, deforestation, overfishing, you know them all, all the way to air pollution and ozone depletion. You see the pattern of change, and the x-axis here is from the Industrial Revolution in the mid-18th century till today. We see that very little happens until a point where you have a branch where the hockey stick pattern takes off. That point is in 1955. It's the point that science is now called the great acceleration point of the human enterprise. From that point on, we are in non-analog time. We are at a point where we're starting to see us affecting the entire planet. Now, if we are concerned about this, we need to understand what is at stake. Because if it's only the pressures, of course you could argue that perhaps the planet is resilient enough to take care of these disturbances. But, oh, this, you, you saw the ball bouncing there. It wasn't meant to go so fast. What you see here is the last 100,000 years, on the y-axis is the variability of living conditions on the planet in temperature, in degrees Celsius. And as you saw the ball bouncing there, it was a very jumpy journey indeed. In fact, over most of this time, we were just between 20 and 30 million people. We were hunters and gatherers. We had to put it simple, a rough time. We enter then the last 10,000 years, which we all learned is the Holocene period, and just look at that extraordinary stability. We have a variation of plus minus one degree on average on the planet during this whole period. This is the period when the biomes settle in. The coral reefs as we know them, all the other terrestrial biomes settle in and start providing the ecosystem services that form the basis for all our economies. This is our desired state. Science can now state that this is what we want to protect. And we asked ourselves, what do we now have to protect in order to stay there? What are the earth system processes that we need to cater for? And could we, from science, define a safe space when being stewards of these systems? But before answering that question, we needed to also look into how do our ecosystems behave? And this is when we come closer to taking on the dry suits and diving in under the surface of the sea. This is snatched from another colleague from the Resilience Center, Magnus Nystrom, who's sitting here, who's found this fantastic clever way of explaining why is biodiversity so important. I mean, after all, isn't it just these beautiful pictures? And preserving species is some kind of ethical responsibility. Well, it's not. Biodiversity is the very strategic toolbox to be able to be sure that we stay in the Holocene stability, that we have human well-being. And how can this be? Well, if you look at a coral reef, for example, you normally just look at it as a number of species, but each species has a functional a, a function at its place in order to keep the system stable and providing livelihoods for coral reefs to over 250 million people in the world. And you can take an analogy with an urban system such as Manhattan. And what if you would cut off 20% of the population in New York? Well, you may argue the system could perhaps still exist, avoid to collapse. Same would go for a coral reef if you just point blank took away 20% of the species. But what if you take out a function? And I can tell you when I told this story to uh, the former Mexican president, Zedillo, who is now the chair of Procter & Gamble, he interrupted me and said, I can tell you, my friend, if you chop out the Mexicans from New York City, it collapses. <laughs> And I told him, well, thank you, Mr. President, that was exactly my point. But I was suggesting, perhaps, that what happens if you take out the fire brigade or the police force. And, and the whole idea is that ecosystems function in exactly the same way. When coral reefs lose their sea urchins, lose their zooplankton, you change the nutrient web, the system risks coming closer to thresholds and may collapse. And what we want to see is, of course, coral reefs that look like this, but increasingly we're seeing coral reefs looking like this. And the reason why they collapse abruptly is that during very, very long, long periods, they have the resilience to withstand disturbance. And the disturbance today comes from multiple sources. It's warming, 
its eutrophication, particularly from leaching of nitrogen and phosphorus from agriculture, its overfishing, its acidification, and then you have a trigger when the system gradually loses its resilience. We are lulled into a comfort zone that the system is in good health, and then an El Nino event makes the whole system collapse. And what happens then, it changes state. And why does it go through such a dramatic regime shift? Well, it's because a feedback hits in. In this case, the system loses its diversity in favor of soft corals that take over, and the whole system becomes a soft, slimy, algal bloom dominated system, which is not desired from anyone's point of view, neither economic nor social. This together, understanding of tipping points and the multiple hockey sticks, led us therefore to design this framework we call Planetary Boundaries. And what it does, it, it defines in green here what is the space within which humanity must stay. And a group of leading global change scientists identified nine big processes that we need to be stewards of to be able to secure a safe future for humanity. And I won't go through them in detail. The important here is just to conclude that it's not only climate change we need to be concerned of at the global scale. It is land, it is water, it's biodiversity, it's nutrients, it's air pollution, it's ozone, it's chemicals, it is the broad issue of air pollution, which is now interacting. And when you place coral reefs right into this, you conclude that essentially all of these planetary boundaries affect and interact with coral reefs. And the interesting thing is that it goes both ways. Healthy coral reefs help us in Sweden to secure a stable economic development because coral reefs themselves have the resilience to be able to support a healthy ocean, for example. So what we're seeing is that coral reefs are both threatened by climate change, eutrophication, biodiversity loss, ocean acidity, but also our system that we now have to be all together governing for our own development. Now, if you make the assessment of where we are with reefs, it is a very sad story, unfortunately. Now, 75% of the world's reefs are threatened to a point where we can no longer exclude that they might flip and collapse over the next 50 years. In fact, the latest assessment shows that if we go on as business as usual, moving beyond two degrees warming and not dealing with eutrophication load and allowing for continued acidification in the oceans, we can no longer exclude that already in two generations we may no longer have tropical, biodiverse rich, tropical uh, coral reefs in the world. So this is in fact a global threat. Now, the evidence from this comes increasingly from observations, and this is just the example of the current degree of leaching coming out of warming events and the projections in the future under climate change. This is the frequency of increased um, bleaching events. The big staple there is the most dramatic 1998 uh, El Nino event. And here you have a story which is rarely discussed. What you have on top here is the normal curve we always look at, which is carbon dioxide emissions. Normally we debate and fight over whether this is or how much this is causing global warming, which is the physical discussion on climate change. But what you see below here is in blue the absorption of carbon dioxide in the oceans. Now this may not be known to you all that roughly half of our emissions of fossil fuel based carbon dioxide is taken up by the biosphere as the world's largest free ecosystem service. So oceans take up a quarter and land areas take up a quarter. A massive support for humanity. But the problem is that when the oceans take up carbon dioxide, which I can tell you has zero uncertainty in terms of where it comes from, it's our emissions of fossil fuels, it causes acidification, which is high school chemistry, when water plus carbon dioxide gives carbonic acid. The drama is that when that pH goes down, it also snatches carbonate from the ocean. And carbonate plus calcium becomes calcium carbonate, which is the Lego blocks for all marine life in the oceans. So our emissions of carbon dioxide is absorbed by the oceans, hiding away a quarter of our climate debt, and it is acidifying and also taking away the Lego blocks from coral reefs. Now look at that pH curve. This is the last 25 million years. The pH stays very, very stable over essentially the whole period, and from the moment we embark on our industrial revolution, pH starts falling dramatically. 
So if you any time sit in a dinner and you get bored of having to argue over climate change with some skeptical friend you had at dinner, and you come to the dessert and you want to have some harmony, take up this question. <laughs> it's zero uncertainty that we are threatening the world's coral reefs because of our fossil fuel emissions related to high school chemistry in the oceans. Now the impacts of this is the following. Look in dark green here, which is good access to the calcium carbonate label blocks. This is the most important one called aragonite. You see the coral reefs and dark dots here. They have, of course, in the Holocene, stabilized themselves in the areas where there's good building blocks. This is before the Dutch Revolution. This is today. And look at the projections into the future. Just 2065, at business as usual, just the acidification driver could knock over the coral reefs. We're not even talking about warming here. We're not talking about overfishing. We're not talking about eutrophication. Just the chemical threat could push us in this direction. And here you have the areas where, in the world, the largest livelihood support occurs from coral reefs, supporting 250 million people just adjacent to coral reefs, and also the regions where there's a lot of capacity to be stewards, active stewards of the coral reefs. And as a final, final slide, then to close here, this is the, the, the kind of doom and gloom summary uh, of the science. Uh, I hope you can now climb up from below the surface and take off your dry suit and uh, now look at the positive side, which Pat pointed out, which is, of course, that there are ample examples today of institutions, of communities, of governors, understanding that we are in this crisis and seeing that as an opportunity to move forward. And we have good examples, the Australian Barrier Reef being one, where things are now moving towards the direction of building resilience towards these threats. But to close, the coral reefs are not only beautiful, they're not only the basis for livelihoods, they're also an early warning system for humanity to move forward. Thank you. Thank you.